Not a matter of if, but when crisis will rock your world. I'm Rashini Rajkumar, licensed attorney, crisis strategist, and host of The Crisis Files. In each case file, we explore a real world crisis. My crisis squad and I seek solutions. We also turn to insiders for advice on current issues that could cause future pain. Today, that insider is Jimmy Sengenberger. He's an investigative columnist for the Denver Gazette and has his own talk show on KNUS in Denver. Recent headlines across the United States showcasing bad behavior at a place you'd least expect. Culture war politics are spreading across school boards in Iowa, Florida, Ohio, and many other places. Jimmy is here to dive into the case file I call School Board Blues. Jimmy, give us a little background. How prevalent is this issue? Thanks for having me. You know, I really think that there's a big phenomenon going on all across the country here in Colorado, where I am, undoubtedly in Minnesota, where you are. And of course, you mentioned a few other states. And I think it is widespread in this moment where you have a lot of focus in the past few years on school boards, particularly in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, where you had government shutdowns of schools and kids were forced out of classrooms into homes. And a couple of things happened. One, You had parents see a lot more of what's happening in the classroom, what their kids are learning, and maybe they didn't like some things if there was a political or cultural bent to some of the education. You also had substantial learning loss, which is persisting, I know, here in school districts in Colorado and in other states. And you have mental health drawbacks, where so many kids now are struggling with serious mental health issues because they found themselves away from the social situations and from so many of the life experiences that they're supposed to have for over a year, up to two years in many cases. And so as a result, we've seen a lot of political discord that has come about and school board races have become very hot commodities. You've got a a lot of focus in terms of money going in and just a lot of attention on what's happening in and out of the classroom relating to school. So it is a big issue, Rashini. Glad to be here about it. Let's break it down. So really, there are kind of some categories we can put this into. Ultimately, a school board role is an unpaid position. It's a leadership position. And I would say in my years growing up and since then, uh, during my years as a television reporter, and I'd on and off cover school board races, rarely would they really make the nighttime news. But now we're seeing them on, across social media platforms, on our newscasts, headlines in the newspapers. And it often comes down to an adult not acting like an adult and not remembering that these are kids we're talking about. The lifestyles of kids, the mental wellness of kids, the education of kids. What is, what I guess could, would you say in your investigations, have you found are some of the common characteristics of the players in these culture wars? I think a lot of what you see is a big focus on spectacle. When you have a splashy story, and a lot of times school boards nowadays aren't like 10 years ago or further back where you would not really see, as you pointed out, those stories. But now, because of political issues or because you don't have what I would say are adults in the room where kids uh, are are being exposed to, to things that Um, uh, really come down to bad behavior on the part of school board members, and then they see those school board members on TV news, it's become a a significant problem. And one thing I look at here in Colorado is you've had several school districts that have been in the news regularly, one of them in Denver with our old school board in, in the city of Denver, really had so much focus, not on education, but on interpersonal squabbles and drama. And there was an investigation a couple years back into one school board member that just bogged down so much time. And I think that makes the frustration all the more palpable because you have parents who just want their kids to get a good education and then they turn on the news and what do they see? School board members being the focus of the story because of things that they're dealing with 
or disagreements among themselves versus what's happening to, say, improve all the learning loss that kids have experienced in the past few years. Or even sideshows in a school board member's personal life. So it really, I mean, it really is crazy. Let's talk about transparency, because what can the public do, whether you are that parent who has kids in the schools across the United States, or you're a neighbor or a concerned aunt. Uh, I'm an aunt of now a toddler, but he's going to be in the public school system very soon. What can we do as the public? Yeah, I think one important thing is to hold school board members accountable by showing up at school board meetings and making sure that your voice is heard, by communicating with the administration as well, because when it comes down to it, it's the principals at your local school that are overseeing day-to-day affairs, being engaged with the, the kids, your kids and their teachers and the education that's happening in the classroom. But in this bigger issue of transparency, that's a significant issue. I'll give you an example. And this really comes down to, as well, the role of of the media. But parents have to be a voice clamoring for change as well. And it's all interconnected in this example. In Denver, in uh, what was March or April of last year, there was a school shooting at a high school. Yes, in 2023. There was a school shooting at a high school of the largest high school in Denver East. And it was uh, tragic where a student ended up taking his own life afterwards. Thankfully, the two deans that he had shot in this pat down um, ended up being okay. They had to be hospitalized, but that worked out well enough for them, but it traumatized students and parents. The next day, the school board in Denver went into an executive session, illegally, by the way, into an executive session for several hours, hashing out what their strategy was going to be from a PR standpoint and some other things. And it took a massive push from the media and from outraged parents to get a recording of that meeting finally released. They lost in court. The district was going to appeal, but the school board said, nope, let's do a vote and finally say, let's release this. Going behind closed doors is becoming a big problem for school boards in Colorado and across the country where they're thinking, if we can just kind of have our disputes behind closed doors, even if it's not necessarily allowed under, say, open meetings laws, we're going to try and do that and get away with it. That's why the media and parents really need to make their voices heard, because that's the only way that you ended up getting the school board there to say, let's finally release this recording. And that's just one example when it comes to so many transparency issues from curriculum on to school policies on discipline and safety and so forth. Accountability comes from the people that are involved from the outside, the parents and also the media. Well, you know, the crisis strategist in me can see reasons why a school board after such a devastating event like that shooting and then self-inflicted suicide uh, can make a school board say we have to have some closed door meetings. But certainly all communication, all meetings cannot be that way. Or there should be certain guidelines that are very much known ahead of time by parents and uh, the community and the media as to when something will be a closed door private session versus open to the public. So this is also that whole get to know the rules. What are the rules of operation in your specific community with your specific school so that when these kinds of tragedies happen or these controversies, you're empowered as a parent or as a neighbor or as an aunt and uncle to ask those questions. Because I think often, you know, the Constitution of the United States does protect schools in some way, you know, the public education right that's mentioned. And I think that's been interpreted over the years by the courts and by schools to mean, okay, schools can do things and we don't question them. But we're really living in a different day and age, aren't we, Jimmy, when it comes to transparency and questioning any kind of behavior? I think that we've had a nationwide crisis of credibility that has been exacerbated since the pandemic. And this really has come to fruition among school boards and school districts, particularly because They're educating kids 
who were going to be the future of our communities, our states, and our countries. And when we look at the kind of education that they're getting, that's one thing. And focusing on improving that quality and recovering the learning loss is critical. But the other thing is, if you see a school district that is constantly in the news because of interpersonal squabbles, or they are seen as being non-transparent, as was the case in both instances of, uh, of interpersonal squabbles and failures for transparency in Denver, you then develop a situation where the school district itself can become the crisis. So it's no longer just about the learning loss or concerns about what's happening with kids' mental health. The crisis is the school district is failing. The school board is not doing right by their communities. And that is the biggest problem, I think, for a lot of these districts, because you shouldn't even be getting to this point. You know this, and, and this is the crisis file. So everybody should keep in mind, I think, you don't want it to get to the point where it's no longer the crisis that you thought you were addressing that is the crisis, but you have become the crisis. Right. You, the individual school board member or the school board in its entirety. All right. So let's talk about another concept in this whole school board blues topic, which is dark money. Very, just like we hear of PAC money and politics and special interests uh, that a lot of politicians sometimes either get in trouble for or they're seeking out that money and those endorsements. In school board situations, in school board elections, there's this concept of dark money, these groups that don't necessarily, uh, that are out there, and those candidates aren't necessarily saying, well, where does that come from? They may not even know. What can you tell us about that? And is that something that we should be worried about as communities? You know, it's really interesting in education when you talk about dark money. I, I mentioned Denver Public Schools, particularly because it's the largest city here in Colorado where I'm based. I've covered the uh, city school board quite a bit, and it's an independent elected school board. So the elections happen in off-year elections. And this was something that came up in 2023, this past November, where you had uh, an influx of so-called dark money going into the school board races, supporting candidates that wanted to unseat the incumbents. We had a, a situation where the teachers union had put forward all seven members of the school board. And so they have their own infrastructure and in place that they've got being this, the, the teachers unions, those organizations in, in school districts around the country. And yet you have these other groups that are sort of cropping up because they're not necessarily in the mold of the union. And so they're finding, OK, what are the ways that we can be able to spend money in school districts, given how much more expensive school board races actually have become? I, I think that there's a little bit of an overstatement as to the impact or problem of uh, dark money in K through 12 education races, because really what we're talking about is a situation where you have high dollar amounts no matter what, and teachers unions are able to do it in their way. And then what are the others, uh, other groups, charter organizations or what have you supposed to do to be able to get involved? Um, I, I think that this is sort of a natural result of some of that in some of the ways that we have campaign finance set up. But I also look at this. In Denver, you had the kinds of problems we were talking about with the school boards and with transparency issues. And there was such a push because parents finally stood up because of school discipline issues and the, the violence and that, that's been growing and the school safety failures that they kept seeing. Parents got motivated and said, we want to have change on the school board to the point where one the most controversial school board member, Tay Anderson, left the board, uh, decided not to run for re-election, and then the other two candidates were soundly defeated. And uh, the reason why they were defeated, I don't think is just because you had some dark money that was backing them, but because there was such a public push galvanized by particular issues, and that money was sort of following the motivations and the passions of the people in the moment, which often happens in politics. Money will follow where the winds are blowing sometimes. Yeah, I always said when I was a TV reporter, 
follow the money. And that is definitely still the case when you're looking at sources of issues uh, and finding any kind of solution. So, Jimmy, your prediction, most of these school boards we're talking about are public school boards, not necessarily private, although I can see some of these squabbles happening in private schools, too. Do you think the very the very fundamental public school system in the United States, regardless of what state or city we're talking about, is in jeopardy of losing students because of these school board blues? I think you've seen enrollment already decline because of the COVID-19 pandemic and parents sort of coming to realization that they have to take a little bit more ownership for the education of their own children. And so you've seen enrollment declines in Colorado and in other states around the country. And I think that's a, a big part of the pandemic, but it also is a little bit of when you have these kinds of irritations, whether it's some parents who think that Politics and cultural issues are in the classroom too much, and so they want to remove their kids from that environment, or they're so frustrated with the sense that the school board just isn't focused on or attentive towards the needs of the students. I think that does exacerbate what is already something brewing. We have a point right now, sort of an inflection point, where parents are recognizing I have the choice and I have to make the choice for what my kid is going to be experiencing for their education, traditional public schools, charter schools, private schools, home schools, what have you, uh, especially in light of the pandemic. But when you have politics at play like this, it only encourages more of that sense of ownership. Okay, the adults are not in the room on these school boards. Now I need to make a change for my own kids. Very well said. Well, I know you will continue to track this. Thank you so much, Jim Jimmy Sangenberger, for your insights. Find more of Jimmy at denvergazette.com and at jimmysangenberger.com. Today's Crisis Brief is brought to you by Mall of America. Number one, running for school board is a commendable endeavor. Inspect your own intentions before applying for the ballot. Number two, as school board elections become more political, do your homework about who's backing any candidate and whether that will influence your vote. Number three, let's not forget these are our children and the future of our country. School board members make impressions on many fronts. An international destination for more than 30 years, the Mall of America continues to draw millions of guests from around the world. But the mall is so much more than shopping. Events, activations, and attractions continue to delight guests of all ages. They're also a strong supporter of the community and nonprofit organizations. Go to mallofamerica.com to find out more. Subscribe to, rate, and review The Crisis Files on your platform of choice. Check out our new website and catch up on all case files at thecrisisfiles.com. Follow us on YouTube and Instagram at The Crisis Files. I'm Rashini Rajkumar. Join me next time on The Crisis Files. <laughs>